Hi everyone, thank you so much for attending this afternoon. We're gonna get started now. My name is Claudia and I'm a part of the Vancouver Point Grey Youth Pod. We are a collection of students in the, uh, v in the VPG constituency that are passionate about being meaningfully involved in our community and interested in politics. We take on projects throughout the year, including engaging youth in conversations that impact them and one of us in this series of events that we are kicking off here today. Next, I'd like to welcome our MLA, David Eby, to help us get this meeting started. David is the MLA for Vancouver Point Grey and BC's Attorney General of Minister of Housing. Welcome, David. Thank you, Claudia, uh, for starting us off. Um, I'd like to begin by recognizing I'm on the traditional territory of the Musqueam people here at uh, the University of British Columbia, and it's a great honor to be here uh, with all of our attendees and our youth council who put in so many hours to organize this event about how we can fight racism uh, in our province and make sure it's a welcoming place for everybody. Uh, it's such an important topic and we have a, an incredibly special guest uh, joining us today, uh, Rachna Singh, the Parliamentary Secretary for Anti-Racism Initiatives, uh, who is, uh, she's been working uh, on issues in the Ministry of Attorney General uh, with me uh, on how we can better address racism in our province and she's got a lot to share. And so I'm so thrilled uh, that our Youth Council has arranged this event uh, so that she can bring uh, a little bit of what she's doing to our community here in Vancouver Point Grey and to all the young people on the call. Um, I really want to thank, and I'm going to name uh, some specific people who helped organize. Uh, you met uh, uh, Claudia. Um, I'd also like to thank their people behind the scenes uh, making this happen. Uh, Kabir, Christina, Eileen, Mew, Bella, Nathan, Emily, Ion. Uh, thank you for your work and for making this happen. Uh, it's really exciting. And thank you, uh, everyone who's joining us online. Uh, because COVID, and thank you for staying home and for uh, maintaining social distance and also for staying engaged uh, despite all of the challenges that uh, public health measures um, bring. So um, what I'd like to do now uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, provide just a little bit of context. We're gonna hear from Rachna uh, today talking about the work she's doing uh, in relation to uh, modernization of the Police Act, but also uh, race-based data collection within the provincial government, new legislation. Uh, that will be introduced by the government. Um, but I'm going to turn things back over to a member of our Youth Council, to Aileen, who will uh, uh, explain a little bit more about the event and what we have coming up. So Aileen, over to you. Hi, folks. First off, I would like to thank both David and Rachna for being here with us today to engage in this crucial conversation. This discussion is the first of many iterations of the Youth Talk hashtag BC Poly series to come. And aside from being an opportunity to find out what the provincial government is up to, we hope to provide space for youth in the community to make their voices heard by their elected officials on pressing issues ranging from homelessness to the climate crisis. Oftentimes we hear that young people are the voices of the present and the future, yet it is still so conventional for our voices to be ignored, droned out, or simply forgotten. Through events such as this one, we aim to foster reciprocal dialogue between youth and the government to bridge these gaps. We look forward to making improvements and incorporating new ideas into the next youth talks as we continue to construct meaningful spaces for young people to share their perspectives. So be sure to stay tuned for upcoming events where we will highlight other imperative topics. At the end of this discussion, we will send out a feedback survey in which you can also leave your contact information if you would like to join our youth council, receive emails about future youth talks, or keep in touch some other way and there will be more information about this to come. I am pleased to pass it over to Christina at this point, who is another member of our Youth Council, and she will go over some community guidelines. Hey folks, um, before we get started, I just want to share some community guidelines for our conversation today to make sure people have the opportunity to take space, make space, and so we can all hold space for a respectful event. Uh, to get started, I want to clarify how we have intentionally set up today's dialogue in order to create a safer space where people are heard and treated with respect that places the spotlight on youth to guide the session, listens to as many voices as we can in our short time together, and prioritizes um, uh, people's safety. We have turned the chat off, structured the session um, to collect questions ahead of time, and have some people ask their questions with their permission and collect more questions from the audience throughout the event over Slido, which Kabir will explain in a moment. We have set this up so that today's event can be respectful and centered BIPOC youth experiences and voices, and we have taken precautions to ensure this. But we also want to let you know ahead of time that if there are any unwanted interruptions, Zoom bombing, or anything like that, that we have procedures in place to immediately kick them out of the room and ensure people feel safe moving forward. 
This is our first time um, running this kind of an event. So we hope this format will work well for this group, but it will likely not be perfect. Um, if you have any questions, you can still communicate with your hosts over the chat. So please get in touch with us there. Um, we really wanna make sure that we can improve our event format going forward. So if this worked well for you, or if you have feedback for improvement, just please let us know um, on our feedback form that will be linked in the chat later on. Um, lastly, as we mentioned in our pre-event email, the video is currently being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube for future viewing. Um, as we've gone through the introduction, the recording has only captured the speakers, but as we move into the Q&A section, um, the audience will be recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, please turn your cameras off so you will not be captured. Um, if you keep your camera on, you consent to being recorded and having the video uploaded. The wonderful Kabir is up next to take us through how you can engage and chat throughout the event using Slido. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much, for uh, Christina, for all that important information. Uh, today, we'll be using Slido, as mentioned, to bring as many voices as possible into the conversation. By following the link that we're going to put into the chat right now, you can see that we have some questions already submitted, and I'll be sharing my screen shortly to show you the process of using Slido if you haven't already. So I'll just do that right now. So once you've clicked on the link that we've provided, you can do this on your phone or on your uh, desktop screen. You can join in on the event. Uh, once you're in there, you'll be able to see all past questions, which gives you an opportunity to upvote any questions that you like. So if someone's already asked a question that you are interested to hear about, you can click on the like button, which you can see up here, and that'll allow you to upvote those questions. And I can see some people already have, so that's awesome. You can also type in your questions right up here in the top. If you'd like to have your question asked anonymously, you can just leave the name empty and I'll ask your question on your behalf. If you'd like to ask your question directly, please do include your name and make sure it's your name that matches your Zoom name. So this way our backend team can actually find you in Zoom and unmute you. So just a reminder, if you're gonna be submitting questions, make sure your name is the exact name you have on Zoom so that we can find you and make sure that uh, we get your question asked directly. Uh, and at this point, I believe I'll be bringing back in Claudia to continue on with our questions. Thanks so much, Kabir. Uh, We're extremely fortunate to have the Parliamentary Secretary for Anti-Racism racism, Rachna Singh here with us. Firstly elected as the MLA for Surrey Green Timbers in, the May, in May of 2017, Rachna was previously the convener of, special, of the Special Committee to appoint a Police Complaint Commissioner and the Special Committee to appoint a Conflict Interest Commissioner in 2001, Rashna moved from India to Surrey to build a better life for her young family of her husband and two children. She has worked as a drug and alcohol counselor, a support worker for women facing domestic violence and a community act activist. She's also worked to improve workers' rights as a representative with the Canadian Union of Public Employees. So without further ado, I am very excited to introduce Parliamentary Secretary Rachna Singh. Welcome Rachna, thank you so much for uh, and joining us today. Thank you so much, Claudia, uh, for your gracious welcome. I'm grateful to be speaking to you all from the shared ter traditional territories of the Samiamu, Ketsi, Kwikwetlam, Kwantlen, Kikite, and Swasan First Nations. And um, we are so grateful for the history, traditions, perspectives, and ways of life that are foundation of this great province, uh, and are the and they also contribute to our strength and prosperity. So honored to be, and uh, I also would like to thank. Uh, uh, Minister Eby, uh, uh, for, uh, I know the Youth Council is behind this, but I really want to uh, just let him know and also Youth Council know that how honored I am to be working with him as the Parliamentary Secretary for Anti-Racism Initiatives. Uh, I'm honored to be part of the government that is committed to building a safer, more inclusive and welcoming province. One where everyone can participate freely and fully in the economic, social, cultural, and political life of British Columbia. As vaccine rollout ramps up, we are seeing the light and at the end of the tunnel, but we cannot forget the systemic issues that surfaced with the pandemic. Through COVID-19, we have seen a rise in anti-Asian and anti-Indigenous racism and a worldwide focus on anti-Black racism through the Black Lives Matter movement. These issues have been top of mind and I applaud you for making space for this important discussion today. Our government has made a commitment to stamp out racism and discrimination in BC. Through years of hard work by dedicate advocates, we have taken some important steps towards, towards this goal, including the reinstatement of the BC Human Rights Commission, 
being the first province to enact legislation on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of the Indigenous People. As parliamentary secretary, I have chance to meet with communities all across the province and hear their stories. So often communities know that they are facing barriers and that, there's, that a policy is not working for them, but the numbers do not exist to back it up and to help them make the uh, case for a change. That's why I'm so proud to be working uh, on, introduce, on introducing the legislation for race-based data collection so that we can point out these inequities and inform policy. I'll also be introducing BC's first anti-racism act. We've had a multiculturalism act for 25 years now, and it's been wonderful. But I always say that celebrations and eating samosas is great, but now let's talk about meaningful change in people's life. I hope governments and institutions across Canada can shift from multiculturalism to anti-racism. We must do more. And let's apply an anti-racist lens to housing, education, policing, labor, and so on. As we look forward to anti-racist world, it also means that we must acknowledge our historical wrongs. Within my mandate, our government has been working with the Japanese Canadian community over the last year to identify appropriate ways to recognize those, those historical wrongs. And I'm looking forward to moving forward with some ideas in the first half of my new mandate. While these are the decisions by, made by our government, it is important to recognize the years of advocacy and grassroots organizing that has led us to these points. These achievements are our collective achievements. And, but our work doesn't stop here. With all what we are doing, we recognize the need, the need for the involvement and cooperation of all sectors to succeed in creating a province free of racism and hate, where everyone has the opportunity to reach their full, full potential. And we must stand together in this work to call out racism when we see it. And we take concrete actions to ensure that our workplaces and our communities are truly welcoming and inclusive. And together we can and we will build a stronger and better future for everyone. Thank you so much. And I'm really looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Rachna. And thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Bella and I'm gonna help facilitate the discussion for the question and answer section of our event today. Um, there will be two sections. The first will be questions that a couple of people have pre-submitted and the, sec the second section will be moder a moderated section from questions from the Slido. Um, please head to the Slido to ask any questions you may have and to vote on the questions that you want answered. Um, the Slido link should just be posted in the chat right now so you can head there. Um, we won't get to all the questions, but we will stay a little later today to make sure most of them are answered. And then we will post those sections. Sorry, we'll post those questions um, after the event. If the speakers could just give us like a little like intro, like who they are, how old they are, what school, anything, um, that'd be great. Um, and with that, we can get started. First, we're going to have a question from Yobi. Um. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Yobi. I'm a secondary school student in the VSB. Um, my question is, how do you plan on prioritizing anti-oppression and anti-racism and moving beyond simply just diversity and inclusion? How is, this, how is the provincial government prioritizing the support of marginalized and racialized groups when it comes to skills training, jobs, and education? Thank you um, so much. Uh, uh... You would like me to answer or uh, Minister E.B.? I think both, okay. Rashna. Why don't you go first? Okay. Okay, I'll start and then Minister can uh, uh, join in. Um, uh, that's a really good question. And I'm very happy uh, uh, that uh, we are taking that route. And uh, I would say that my appointment as the first, anti, first parliamentary secretary for anti-racism is a step towards that. And uh, we've had, uh, as I mentioned before, that we've had the Multiculturalism Act for 25 years, and we have done very well with multiculturalism, uh, celebrating our festivities, uh, uh, recognizing different cultures, uh, and that has been great. And, uh, but what that has, um, uh, what we feel now, and as I, being a racialized person, I have felt it, that uh, talking about the cultures, celebrating our festivals is great. Uh, but we need to go beyond that, especially talking about the difficult issues, talking about the uh, systemic issues that are imbibed in our system. 
And when you talk about the oppression, the communities that have been oppressed for generations, and uh, also even now, uh, they, uh, especially with the new immigrants coming, coming, uh, coming to this country and the barriers that they are facing. Um, so we really need to work towards that. So the, my mandate letter is uh, all about this and uh, what we are doing with our government, what the Premier Horgan has done uh, with the mandate letters that he has given all, uh, to all my colleagues uh, in the cabinet, all the parliamentary secretaries, it's, it talks about uh, looking at their work with the anti-racist lens. Uh, so the work that I will be doing with the creation of the uh, legislation for the anti-racism legislation, race-based data, these are the steps forward. Uh, and also you mentioned about the, um, uh, you said something about the uh, in post-secondary. Can you just repeat that? Like uh, what were, uh, what were you looking in there? And I can answer that part. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, you were asking about the specific in like Ministry of Education question, part of the question? Right, um, you asked something about post-secondary. I missed that, like what exactly was the question? Uh, yeah, I was just uh, wondering what, uh, how I think as a secondary student that is part of a visible minority, uh, mm -hmm. I've felt that teachers and um, mm -hmm. like and at administrators mm -hmm. um, don't quite have the training to deal with racism or racism at schools, mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily um, their fault per se. Mm -hmm. But like, how, what is the province um, doing about training teachers and putting teachers in a position where they can feel comfortable about um, dealing with issues of racism at schools? Oh, that's, that's a really good question. Uh, and thanks for bringing that. And I, I know uh, living in a community that is so diverse and we have so many students uh, from different backgrounds studying uh, in, in our educational institutions. And I I've heard a number of stories uh, about the barriers that they are facing. Um, uh, about the training of the teachers, uh, that is something I, I'm sure that my colleague, uh, 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 Ann Kang, Minister Kang in advanced education is looking, it, looking at it. Um, and uh, Minister Evie uh, would like to maybe give more information about that, but also some programs that we are bringing in for the uh, post-secondary students, especially with COVID. We know how uh, it has impacted all the students, but especially the uh, racialized uh, students. And uh, that's why we have put in the resources in there. Uh, the $4 million grants have been awarded to different educational institutions. And that is just to help the students who are struggling, uh, the barriers that they are facing. And most of them uh, I think they, most of the students impacted more by, uh, by these challenges are the racialized students. So that's what we have in place at this time. And uh, I, I would uh, uh, open the floor for Minister Evie to add some more comments. Thanks, Rashna. Uh, just on that point, uh, Ministry of Education is uh, currently working on uh, incorporating uh, and ensuring that uh, the curriculum that the that the, the teachers are actually teaching in the classrooms uh, includes uh, important anti-racist education um, initiatives, whether it's around uh, history or anti-oppression uh, practices or otherwise. Uh, we're providing opportunities for teachers to have those discussions in classrooms. And at the administrative level, I've seen it uh, firsthand what you're describing as well. Um, and we put in place a human rights commissioner in the province whose job in part uh, is to support um, anti-racist practices in different institutions across the province through education and outreach. Um, but it's not just her job. Um, we also um, uh, have had to make sure that we have a process in place where uh, if matters can't be dealt with at the school board, that the human rights tribunal um, process is there and available and that people are supported in going forward. So we have a human rights clinic, a legal clinic through the community legal assistance service for people who feel that they need to get some kind of support outside of the school board system or, or some kind of accountability for incidents that they face in relation to their education. And um, just on your question too, we're taking a long time on your question. There's lots of questions. So I'll try to uh, be, uh, to wrap things up quickly. There's just so much going on. Uh, we have community benefits agreements, which is a, a structure that we put in place for major infrastructure pro projects in the province to make sure that people from groups that are not appropriately represented in the trades in BC uh, do get a chance. Uh, women, uh, BIPOC, uh, people in the province, have a chance to work on major infrastructure projects, get trades, 
uh, and have opportunities to benefit from public spending on roads, hospitals, schools, and other kinds of projects like that. These community benefits agreements are quite transformative in uh, giving people a chance to become apprentices like that. And another example of an anti-oppressive uh, policy that we've put in place is around my ministry in the justice system, where um, recognizing that the justice system incarcerates and criminalizes uh, disproportionately very significant numbers and worsening numbers of Indigenous people across the province. Um, we sat down with uh, the Indigenous, uh, with the First Nations Justice Council and said, um, we'll provide you with support, uh, financial and infrastructure support, so that you can design a justice strategy for Indigenous people by Indigenous people. And then we'll work with you in partnership around implementation. And just last month, uh, they took over responsibility, just this month, uh, they took over responsibility for um, a part of the legal aid system that relates exclusively to Indigenous people called Gladue Reports, um, uh, which is a, a technical uh, report about someone's background that goes to a judge on sentencing. But uh, having Indigenous people uh, having control over and jurisdiction and authority over matters that affect Indigenous people, uh, uh, designing a justice strategy for Indigenous people by Indigenous people, these are the kinds of things that we're building right into the system. Uh, uh, whether it's around building infrastructure or the justice system or the education system to try to be anti-oppressive in how we work um, so that it's communities that are leading this work, whether it's around uh, the history of a particular community and the curriculum in the school or the justice system uh, with Indigenous people or the CBA process to make sure that folks are appropriately represented and get equal opportunity. So there's lots of exciting things going on. Uh, it's a great question. Thanks for asking. Thank you so much for those great answers. Uh, next, we're gonna move to Saad with a question. Hi there, um, I just wanted to ask a question uh, about post-secondary um, uh, systemic barriers and historic barriers that exist. Uh, so in understanding that marginalized students often uh, experience intersectional systemic and historic barriers when it comes to funding a post-secondary education, uh, how will the provincial government seek to actively work towards removing those barriers and ensure, uh, and ensure that more marginalized folks uh, are pursuing a post-secondary education. Minister, you want to take it first? I always like it when you go first, Rashna, but I'm happy to go first. <laughs> so thanks, uh, that's a great question. And, uh, and um, one of the initiatives, uh, there are a couple um, important initiatives uh, that we've rolled out in our first uh, round as government the last three and a half years, and there's more to come, but the ones that I was particularly proud of our government around and, and under the leadership of Melanie Marcus, Advanced Education Minister, was ensuring that every post-secondary institution had an Indigenous person uh, on the board of the organization to ensure that uh, post-secondary institutions across the province uh, reflected and considered the specific uh, needs of Indigenous uh, students and Indigenous communities in their area. Uh, but the, the other piece was uh, around free tuition and, and accommodation for uh, kids leaving uh, care of government or aging, um, uh, aging out of the, the care system uh, so that they had an opportunity to succeed. And this uh, is a group that faces huge intersectional challenges, uh, disproportionately um, uh, Indigenous, but also um, uh, facing all kinds of uh, life challenges and uh, giving those students uh, free tuition and support to succeed in post-secondary um, was a really important, province-wide was a really important initiative. Um, there are other uh, direct student supports that uh, government has put in place, um, but I think maybe uh, I'll turn it over to Rashna to talk about uh, how the race-based data piece that she's working on might relate to your question. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Minister. You have highlighted some of the initiatives that we have taken as the government. Um, also, like having a, a, a son who goes to the university, I just came to realize how expensive it was. And, uh, uh, I, that, and I recognized my privilege at the time, uh, being a racialized person, but also the privilege that I had that I could afford it. And, uh, but at, at the same time, it made me realize the barriers that uh, when we talk about the education being the uh, greatest equalizer, but like some people not having that opportunity. Uh, so, uh, we understand the barriers and that's why uh, creating the uh, tuition free, uh, interest free uh, tuition loans, um, that was another e initiative by our government. Uh, and uh, I think um, looking at like a uh, minister has already talked about looking at it from the intersectional point of view, uh, that is like very close to my heart, like intersectionality, uh, even within the diversity, we know about the intersectionality, that how uh, some, uh, 
when we are talking about the racialized po population and uh, uh, but they are within the racialized population there there's uh, there's more marginal uh, there are certain communities more marginalized some students not being able to uh, uh, take the opportunities that are available and that's why i think uh, uh, it is important about the race based data collection we need to get that data like how some people are falling behind uh, what are the policies that we need to work on uh, but at the same time we are very aware that it is a very sensitive topic like the communities that are already marginalized already oppressed we don't want to further stigmatize those communities so a uh, lot of groundwork has already been done and i'm sure that in the uh, further questions i'll be talking more in detail about the race based data but that is this is what, like what you are talking about, the um, uh, inequities in our post-secondary education system. This is what we really like to find out, like how certain communities are being left behind and what kind of policies as government we can bring in to fill those barriers. Thank you so much for those questions. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Sahaj. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm from Surrey and a post-secondary student at UBC. My questions on how race-based data collection has influenced law enforcement practices in BC. Should Question. I go first, Minister? Yeah, you go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, race, like that, is a very important question, and that is like uh, what we have been hearing from the communities: that lack of the race-based data. Uh, we don't have that information. We, uh, we in some uh, sectors, we have come to know about it. Uh, uh, the report that came out in plain sight, talking about the disparities in our healthcare system, uh, that was only able to come out because they were collecting that data for the indigenous populations. But number of sectors, we are not collecting that data. And also the committee that I sit on, uh, the Police Act Review Committee, uh, and uh, this thing is coming out over and over again, um, that we know about the stories, the over-representation, over-policing uh, of uh, certain communities, especially of our Indigenous and Black communities. Uh, but we don't have the concrete data to bring in the policy to uh, combat that. So um, uh, this is made clear by the community organizations, by the grassroots organizations. And this is what the work that we have started under my mandate. Uh, we have already started consulting uh, with the uh, community organizations to find out ways how to collect that data. How do we start that public consultation in the in the right way? That uh, that when we collect that, how to collect that data, how to store that data, and how to roll the, roll out that data. So that work is already in progress, and and I think uh, uh, really uh, this is a long time coming. Uh, it took a long time to for us to get to this point, but we are on the right track because we know at the same time the sensitivity of this data uh, and the, uh, the light that this data will shed on different barriers, the gaps the communities are facing, uh, not just with the policing, but also with the law enforcement. Yeah, I mean, we can see the impact of collecting this kind of data in a, a specific example around policing, which is called street checks is where a police officer stops someone to have an interaction with them. And, uh, and uh, from a police perspective, just a conversation, the person doesn't have to participate, but from the perspective of the person who stopped, uh, they don't feel like they have the ability to leave that conversation or not participate, even though that may be their right. So it's, it's been a fairly significant uh, uh, concern, not just in Vancouver uh, or uh, other parts of the province, but, but really across North America, the use of street checks by police. And collecting data about the number of street checks and who is being stopped in Vancouver um, has really shifted how police um, uh, themselves uh, view street checks and when they should do them uh, and how they were using uh, street checks because we've seen a shift in the use by the VPD of street checks following their uh, collection of data around using them and around who is being stopped uh, around uh, collecting race-based data. And so uh, this can be a very race-based race, race -based data that uh, the legislation is going to enable that Rachin is talking about can be a really important part of policing and around the police, uh, the review of the police act as well. Uh, and and Rachin is so right. We just have to make sure that uh, when we're doing this, um, that it is done in a way that supports and addresses the concerns of communities uh, rather than um, creates uh, problems uh, or additional challenges for those communities. And that's the work that is ahead, ahead for her. That's a great question. Thanks. 
All right, thank you everybody so much for those incredible questions and Rushna and David for your thoughtful responses. Um, next, we're gonna be moving on to the, quest or the Slido question part of our discussion and Kabir will be leading that part. Thanks so much, Bella. And thanks, uh, David and Rushna for your answers so far. It's been super insightful to, to hear a lot of what you guys are working on. Um, we're gonna go now into our Slido question and answer portion. So thanks to everyone who submitted your questions. We have a ton of important questions coming in and we'll try our best to answer as many as possible. Um, we may go a little bit over 6.30, but after the event, we will post the recording for anyone who wants to see on YouTube. Uh, if you need a concrete answer, however, and some of the questions we see in here are very specific. So if you're in that category, please do uh, reach out to David's staff. So that's david.ev.mla at ledge.bc.ca. I'll drop it in the chat as well, because that is a lot of dots. Um, <laughs> but if you have a lot of specific questions around complaints and, and those kind of things, please do reach out directly. Um, a reminder that if you submitted the question anonymously, I'll read it on your behalf. Uh, and if your name is in your question here, we'll be reaching out to you uh, to be unmuted. The first question we have here is from someone named Beck, but I don't believe we'll be, we were able to reach out to them in Zoom. So I'll ask on their behalf. Uh, the question is around hate crimes. What is the BC government doing about the rising rate of anti-Semitic and anti-Asian hate crimes? Yeah, that's a great question. Rashna, you wanna? Yeah, uh, no, yeah. and it is, and it is, I am sure it is on everybody's mind these days, uh, especially with the onset of pandemic. And we have seen the rise in uh, anti-Asian hate crimes. And also like every day we are seeing some incidents of anti-Semitic uh, uh, incidents happening all over British Columbia. Uh, so this is very sad and uh, I cannot uh, uh, reiterate enough that uh, how as a government uh, we we feel that this is this is um, uh, this is a province that everybody should be treated equally but we know that racism does exist and with, whenever any crisis comes and uh, it it gets to the forefront uh, as a government uh, we have uh, we even before the pandemic we set up uh, our anti racism network which is known as resilience bc it was uh, set up in 2019 and uh, uh, and it has uh, spokes. It has like it has hub in Victoria, and it has fifty spokes, like fifty organizations that are working all across BC. And uh, this is, I think, that is a great resource, especially with the rise in the uh, hate crimes. Uh, these are the spokes that are providing the frontline support to the victims and the organizations impacted. Uh, one example that I would give is like in Richmond. Uh, Richmond Women's Center was doing their. AGM, it was on a Zoom call and it was bombarded by anti-racist, uh, by racist uh, uh, comments. And uh, so that uh, the spoke in Richmond reached out to Richmond Women's Center to provide the support. Uh, we have enhanced the funding uh, for, uh, for Resilience BC. Uh, just recently, just yesterday, we have announced uh, our multicultural, uh, multicultural uh, uh, culturalism grants that have been given to more than 190 organizations, especially uh, the organizations that are working uh, uh, working uh, for anti-Asian, anti-Indigenous or anti-Black racism who are uh, working on the front lines to deal with that. So about um, half the grants were given to those organizations. Uh, uh, raising uh, awareness, I think that is the most important thing that we can do. Um, I, I think uh, uh, whenever we are in this state, there is need to be done more, uh, but as I said, education is the key. We have launched the uh, anti-racism uh, awareness campaign. Also, I'm sure Minister will talk more about what he's doing in his, uh, um, uh, in his, in his role to, uh, especially with the penalties and uh, uh, with the law enforcement. Uh, so I'll over to Minister. Thanks, Rachna. So uh, within police, um, there are um, specialized units around hate crimes. Uh, and the idea is that um, when somebody reports to police a, a hate crime, uh, that the police uh, have officers with training to try to mitigate uh, any additional trauma that can come from the investigation and uh, uh, process. And then uh, after it's handed over to Crown Counsel, the prosecutors, our provincial government has uh, the prosecution services independent of government. 
um, but we've made sure, uh, and uh, and I work with the prosecutors to make sure that they have a dedicated team within uh, the prosecution service that has the expertise on hate crimes around prosecutions and supporting victims. One of the biggest challenges, understandably, is when someone's a victim of a hate crime, um, many, many times uh, because of various uh, reasons, uh, all totally legitimate, they may not want to participate in any kind of further police investigation, uh, prosecution, criminal trial with the person who just attacked them. Uh, this is not uh, particularly unique to hate crimes, but it is particularly acute with hate crimes. And it's a big challenge that uh, our a criminal justice system often requires some level of participation by the victim who's already marginalized and been victimized potentially in other ways. It would make them or vulnerable in some way that, uh, that they don't wanna come forward with this complaint. And so this is a real challenge for us uh, in terms of wanting to hold people accountable, like really accountable uh, for their actions uh, in spreading hate. We just had an incident of, uh, of uh, anti-Semitic vandalism in Victoria. It's uh, shaken up the community there. There's uh, just a huge spike in anti-Asian uh, uh, racist incidents across North America right now and in British Columbia. And so uh, what we're trying to do is identify ways that people can report, provide information to us, and also that we can hold people accountable that may not require the full participation of the person who's been the victim of the hate crime. So uh, an example from another jurisdiction uh, is, uh, is a ticket-based uh, system that has been uh, imposed uh, in some jurisdictions where we recognize it's not as good as a criminal uh, uh, penalty, but it's a recognition when someone gets a ticket for, uh, for hateful conduct, uh, that they know that this is something that's not sanctioned, it's not supported, it costs them money, uh, and uh, as opposed to just no consequence. So I'm not saying that that's necessarily the solution for BC, but we have to be looking for, and we are looking for ways to hold people accountable without insisting that the person who is the victim of the crime be the one who has to carry it all the way through. Uh, because we know a lot of the challenges that uh, a lot of vulnerable communities have about bringing forward complaints about this kind of thing. And so we're trying to wrap the supports around people to do that, um, but we've got lots more work to do. Yeah, thanks so much. I think it's really important to hear that, especially a time like now that we're experiencing such a rise in this kind of hate that there's both the support in the communities through those different spokes and different uh, organizations out there as a support system, but also that the legal system is supportive and making sure that these people face consequences for what they're doing uh, without having to re-victimize folks for what they experience. So um, really glad to hear some of those things. Um, our next question here is actually from Emmy, who I'll invite up to speak. And her question is surrounding counseling. Hi there, my name is Emmy. I'm a self-employed corporate wellness specialist. I teach yoga for tech companies. Um, I met David in 2019 to discuss an incident of anti-Asian hate that I experienced at the federal election polls. So I'm still waiting for that to be resolved. It didn't get resolved, but um, it, racism exists at the polls. I just want to say that. Um, this question was inspired because I was volunteering at Family Services BC, and um, I found out that there is only one free counselor in the entire province for postpartum women, for, for mothers, for mothers. There is one counselor for the whole province for this specific uh, demographic. And I was really appalled that uh, free counseling is extremely hard to come by in this uh, province. And that's a serious issue right now. Um, there's no general mental health line for people to call. So um, my question is, and I'd like to pose it to Rachna, Rachna first. Thank you so much for being here, Rachna. It's a really an honor to meet you. Um, I'm also a, a Punjabi Sikh, so. <laughs> um, okay, so when will counseling and therapy finally be provincially supported? especially uh, supporting BIPOC wellness professionals who understand the complex intersectional cross-cultural psychosocial issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. And, uh, uh, and I think um, come, uh, having, um, having my, uh, like in my previous life, I used to be a counselor. So I know the challenges that you are talking about and especially the culturally sensitive services uh, and living in a community that is so diverse and uh, and I see the stigma attached also to seek out these resources. Uh, that is another factor, especially with the mental health issues. A lot of times, and uh, in our communities, people 
don't even want to talk about it. They just want to uh, say, oh, it's nothing, right? And uh, uh, so uh, I can say that a um, uh, um, lot has been done uh, uh, and uh, uh, what the steps that we have taken, especially uh, providing more resources to our nonprofit organizations. I don't have specific information about like what you are talking about the new mothers like that I would really like to know more about. Uh, but the, uh, I can say from the study perspective, the resources that were given out, uh, especially uh, with the COVID, with the pandemic and we knew uh, the, uh, especially with the domestic violence, uh, we know uh, that uh, uh, the st stats showed us that the rise in domestic violence uh, during uh, during the pandemic and uh, more enhancements to the organizations like Sari Women Center, uh, Diversity Picks, the organizations that were working with the uh, different diverse populations, especially with the women. Uh, so those supports have been given out by our government. Uh, and also for the mental health resources, uh, I can say that culturally appropriate mental health resources have also been set up. I have more knowledge about Surrey because that is my community. I'm sure uh, it would be all across BC, uh, but in Surrey we have uh, a, a, a special clinic, it's called Rosh, Roshni Clinic that caters mostly uh, just to the South Asian population because, uh, and with, especially with the stigma attached uh, with the, uh, and not just with mental health, but just anytime like people are talking about seeking counseling, a lot of times like, uh, and uh, you are Punjabi, you would say, uh, oh, what's wrong with you? You have such good life, you have a good husband, you have kids, uh, you have enough money, what is wrong with you, right? So they try to downplay it, water it down. So uh, and knowing that factors, uh, uh, putting in the resources, sometimes uh, it is difficult for a person to seek out the resources. So we are trying to break that stigma, uh, creating that awareness campaign. And I, I'm sure that my colleague, uh, uh, Minister Malcolmson, she's working very closely with different communities, how to break those barriers. Um, over to Minister, if he has uh, something. Yeah, sure, it's, a, it's an interesting question, Emmy. thank you. Um, uh, uh, the reason I know about this resource is because my uh, partner worked there. Uh, as a physician, uh, uh, Women's uh, Hospital has a, a reproductive mental health program available by referral for free to women across BC. Um, who are struggling either pre pre pregnancy or post pregnancy, um, and or during pregnancy with any kind of mental health issue or uh, distress related to that, and uh, it's a really wonderful service, and I encourage um, uh, folks to look into that. Um, and it is available. It's quite um, it's quite a good and comprehensive uh, program for for women who are are struggling with postpartum mental health issues. Um, and uh, as far as specific uh, services for unique communities that uh, minimize the barriers to accessing those services, that's a service that's only available by referral from a physician. So that's already a barrier for some people. Um, it's a really good question. And I, I don't have information immediately available about that, about referrals and support for different communities, but that's something we can definitely follow up on. It sounds like you're in touch with communities um, that, uh, that you could help um, refer them to culturally appropriate services. And we definitely have those around Indigenous populations, South Asian and Asian populations in British Columbia, um, uh, different populations that, uh, that need supports and reduced barriers. Uh, so we can get that information to you and, uh, and you can share it around to the folks who, who you've identified who need it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for your question, Emmy. Our next question here is from Will, who will be talking about data collection. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, uh, Minister Evie, excellent to see you. Um, uh, Miss Singh, excellent to uh, meet you. Uh, my name is Will. My pronouns are he, him, his. I am actually a policy student over at the UBC School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. And my question is surrounding um, this interesting thing that we've been taught as policy students, which is gender-based analysis plus. And so I'm actually kind of curious um, how race-based data will be used alongside uh, other data collection methods, such as, you know, information on gender, disability, sexuality, and even neurodivergence um, for policymaking at the provincial level. And that's a really good question, Bill. Thank you so much uh, for that. And uh, intersectionality, it is, uh, it is personal to me. And uh, um, uh, being a woman of color, uh, but uh, also, uh, as I've said before, I recognize, I uh, know the barriers that I've faced, but also the privileges that I've had. Uh, uh, and also, but I know how uh, intersectionality plays a role. Uh, and that's why when we are going to do our consultations and uh, we want to see it, we want to do it from the intersectional perspective. Uh, we will be, uh, right now, we, uh, we are still working with our staff how to develop that, uh, 
platform, but we want to reach out to as many communities possible, uh, especially with the uh, for the women, uh, especially women, the racialized women, uh, indigenous, black, and racialized women. We would like to have separate consultations with them. Also, communities, uh, the LGBTQ plus communities, want to have uh, their perspective. Working very closely, uh, I'm very glad that we have a parliamentary secretary for gender equity and. Uh, uh, and accessibility uh, now. And uh, uh, so working very closely with them uh, to look out, uh, uh, to seek out the stakeholders that they they might recommend that we should be talking to. And uh, this is a, a thing that has been brought up, uh, brought up by the Human Rights Commissioner as well, that when we were having conversation with that, she was talking about this, having this lens, the intersectional lens, and that is very, very important and it is personal to me. Thank you so much for this question. Nice to see you, Well. Awesome. Our, our next question here was actually submitted anonymously, so I'll be asking it on behalf of the question asker. The question is, my aunt was called a racial slur last week in, the point, in Point Grey in her own apartment building. There is no easy, accessible way to report hate crimes. What can we do about this? Thanks. Yeah, I, um, you know, an, an incident like that can be reported to police um, and, uh, and should. Um, but it can feel like a very big step for someone, uh, especially in relation to a neighbor in their own building. Um, and uh, when they're already feeling unsafe about that kind of situation, I think this is, this is one of the issues we were talking about a bit earlier about how when someone's a victim of, uh, of hate like that, um, how they understandably um, might be reluctant to, uh, to report it um, and that the reporting mechanisms that exist might be inaccessible for any number of reasons. Um, and, uh, and so this is something that we're uh, taking really seriously, this gap between uh, nothing and, uh, and the police. <laughs> we need something that um, provides people a sense of safety in reporting. That's part of the Resilience BC intention. Um, but not everyone knows about that and not everyone has access to that in that way. So uh, it is something that uh, we're working on in the ministry, Rashna. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, no, and that's a really good question. And this is what we have been brainstorming. And I was just talking to just before uh, this event, we were I was talking to minister about it. And the staff is also looking at avenues because this is coming out. This gap is coming out like a lot of times, like when especially such a traumatic event happens with you, uh, police does not seem the uh, right uh, uh, resource for a lot of people and uh, they feel first of all they uh, they are dealing with such trauma they don't feel safe talking to the police uh, in those circumstances so I know that I've heard about those stories uh, and uh, but we are looking at the avenues that are already in place uh, a minister has already talked about resilience BC we have talked to different spokes uh, talked to um, uh, uh, Queenie Chu uh, who's the uh, uh, executive director at Success, uh, looking out resources, but also looking at our crisis, uh, different crisis lines, which are already providing crisis support, uh, uh, which are all, which is already in, in place. So we are trying to find out if there's any possibility of enhancing those crisis lines uh, so that they can provide support for hate and racism as well. So that is an avenue that we are looking into. Thank you so much. That is very, very important question. Perfect, thank you. Our next question here is from Najoki uh, about climate change. Awesome. Hi. Hello, uh, Emily. David, Evie, and Rachna. Uh, nice to hear from both of you. Uh, my name is Njoki. Oh, I'd like to start my video. Well, okay, let's do that. It's not the best conditions, but we'll do it. Um, I'm very, I just graduated from UBC last year currently just adulting. And I'm really passionate about food justice, but particularly also looking at uh, land care and stewardship. And since we are in BC, which is quote unquote resourceful, uh, I would like to think on how the government is supporting through funding and resource allocation initiatives that are led particularly by indigenous and black youth to care for the land and promote um, food justice uh, for all of us. Thank you. Rashna, I'm happy to go first if you. Yeah. Yes, please. So um, 
with with indigenous communities, um, uh, both on and off reserve, uh, the the approaches are um, different. So we have um, uh, economic uh, development agreements with nations across the province, and most recently, uh, really exciting agreements with Lake Babine and Carrier Cani uh, First Nations, uh, which include almost um, all these agreements with a very significant focus on the land around food security, uh, around um, traditional uh, means of gathering uh, food, hunting, uh, fishing rights, uh, and so on. Um, and so, uh, it, and so um, these agreements uh, are critically important, both from a perspective of nutritional security, uh, that people have enough food to eat, um, but also uh, from a perspective of, um, of uh, a sense of uh, a connection to the land which is so important for so many communities. And so um, for those uh, economic development agreements, that's really um, been quite a critical thing. Um, with respect to um, uh, off-reserve communities and food security, um, I think there's lots more work that we can do and lots of opportunities, but we have been providing a lot of support around um, marginalized communities and access to produce at the farmer's markets, for example. Um, and, uh, and the ability for folks to be able to access fresh produce at farmers markets, with, which both connects them to farm uh, communities, even though they live in cities, uh, and to food producers, uh, but also provides uh, highly nutritious food, as well as uh, ensuring that food programs that we offer through schools and other uh, institutional settings include species um, produce. The uh, really specific question you're asking about, um, are there internships or economic development opportunities uh, or so on for uh, specifically in the area of agriculture uh, for uh, BIPOC communities uh, in the province. It's not something I know the answer to off the top of my head, but it's definitely um, something we can get the information uh, for you about from the Ministry of Agriculture and the minister there, Lana Popham, is very passionate about getting young people involved in food production. And I know on the economic development side, there are programs that focus on uh, among other uh, groups, black business owners um, in our province to support them, maybe not young people specifically, but uh, broadly inclusive. Um, so there are lots of programs, but just on that very specific uh, group and that area, I just need a little bit more uh, time to gather that information for you. But I think I, I should have some good news for you in terms of what we're doing. Um, and if not, uh, it seems like a really good opportunity and I can connect you with the agriculture minister uh, if this is an area of background and expertise that you have. Rushner, are you aware of anything off the top of your head? No, uh, that's what I'm going to say, uh, uh, what you have said, David. Uh, Minister uh, Popham, uh, she's very, very passionate about this and uh, would love to uh, get I more so information. Too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you, if, you, uh, if you DM your, uh, your uh, email address to, uh, to one of the organizers, we'll make sure to follow up with you. Yeah. Thanks very much for that question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next question is from Noah. I just want to say thank you for, for such a great event. Um, really interesting conversations happening. My question is, what consequences do people who are employed by the BC government face if they're found guilty of racist actions or words? What's the process of accountability? Thanks, that's a, that's a really good question. So there are a number of uh, different entities of government, whether it's uh, teachers, police, courts, uh, court government, and, and most of them have separate accountability processes. So within government, uh, there is an internal discipline process. It's a unionized environment. Uh, so there is a discipline process that would result in someone's dismissal. Um, there is also a process that we established through new legislation, whistleblower legislation, where if someone doesn't feel safe reporting to their manager, they can go to the ombudsperson of BC directly and uh, share up to and including confidential information from that ministry about what's happening that, uh, that could be uh, racist, discriminatory, or otherwise problematic. Uh, and the ombudsperson then conducts the investigation rather than a direct manager in that section in the provincial government. Um, for groups like uh, teachers and police, uh, judges, they, they all have, because they're um, separate uh, from core government, uh, they tend to have uh, uh, separate and independent complaints related processes. Um, uh, so for judges, there's the judicial council, for police, there's a police complaints 
uh, commission. Um, and for teachers, there's the discipline process through their collective agreement. Um, uh, there is not one of those uh, uh, entities within the provincial government that doesn't take uh, racism, allegations of racism uh, really seriously and inve investigate them very thoroughly. Often it involves third, third party investigators coming in to do a review. Um, and, uh, and the goal obviously is uh, people feeling safe at work. Um, and also uh, it's not just responding to racism, it's also proactive training. So uh, within core government, um, there are mandatory professional development um, uh, uh, programs for uh, employees within provincial government around uh, um, anti-oppression uh, training so that uh, workplaces can be welcoming and, uh, and folks can identify ways to intervene and be a good ally and support people in the government. Uh, government's a really um, great place to work. Um, it's interesting work and, uh, and I uh, encourage uh, folks to think about it. And also uh, it's not perfect. Um, so we need to have those systems in place and they need to be comprehensive. And um, I don't think the systems are perfect, but, uh, but we're constantly working on improving them and responding to them as, as issues come up. And another piece is around making sure that we have good representation in positions of power within government. So one of the things we're doing is making sure that our boards uh, that oversee various organizations, there's probably about a uh, hundred different boards. I don't think I'm exaggerating of uh, post-secondary institutions, crown corporations, tribunals, uh, you name it. Uh, and we appoint people to these boards that oversee uh, these different entities. And so we're tracking and making sure that we're improving the diversity of these governance bodies uh, so that the governance bodies that are responding to these complaints and concerns around discriminatory practice are representative of the communities and the folks who may be making, bringing these concerns forward. Thanks very much, Noah, and thanks for the, the compliment to the Youth Council. I think they've done a great job too. This has been a very good event. Thank you so much, Noah. Our next question is from Amen. Yeah, hello everyone. And thanks to the Ministry and Parliamentary Secretary for organizing this. So I have this question about, uh, so I, do, I study information analysis and I find that when we do race-based data collection, uh, for instance, in policing and other areas as well, what happens is there are a lot of immigrants who come to Canada and for their, for them, for greater part of their life, their sense of belongingness or identity is not what the race-based data categories identify or put them as a label. So what happens is when they are categorized into certain categories which are pre-existing in Canada, which the host nation has, those may not be the immediate sense of identification or, or, or the way they see themselves to be. So how does uh, race-based data collection navigate this issue? I think that's a really good question, Aman, and this is what we have been working on, and uh, especially with our immigrant populations. Um, we know that uh, when immigrants come, like they bring different experiences and different, um, uh, 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 and no two immigrants are similar, like we cannot just do the generalization. And even with the, I'll just give you an example within the Muslim population that uh, when we are talking to a Muslim woman who wears a hijab or a Muslim woman who does not wear a hijab, uh, there's a big difference. So I think the intersectionality uh, plays a big role in this. And uh, that's why uh, uh, we really want to do, when we start these consultations, we really, before we get into the public mode of it, uh, we want to get all the information, how to do it uh, uh, in the right way when we go out, uh, that people feel safe giving that information. We, don't want to, for some people, giving, the, giving out that information also is a, a quite a scary a prospect, like because from the countries, especially they have come from how police has treated them uh, or how the organizations have treated them. And uh, giving out the information has created more stigmatization or more brutality for them. Uh, so that's what we want to break those barriers when we go out and reach out and also giving the proper information about the race-based data. Like these terms, uh, race-based data, disaggregated uh, data, 
these are sometimes like very alien terms for some, certain populations. So giving out that uh, information in the right culturally sensitive way is very important. Um, or just going into that question that we are collecting the data, I don't think that's the way uh, to make people feel safe. Uh, it is like uh, the gradual steps that we might need to take to uh, provide that education, uh, reach to that point that they feel safe giving that information and having them having them fully involved when we uh, uh, when we get this legislation out the people are aware and they feel safe and they have the complete knowledge about it i think those are the keys uh, to address this problem yeah it's an, it's an incredibly tricky issue and and that's why we'll be uh, doing a lot of work up front i mean when you talk about just say asian south asian I mean, you're talking about hundreds of millions of people across all different countries with different perspectives and beliefs, religions, uh, and, and oh, you know, Asian. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's uh, very unfair to the lived experience and perspectives of the people who get that label put on them. And I, I think uh, I'm on the point you raise is a really vital one and, uh, and one we're gonna have to be really careful about um, because uh, uh, it's, uh, you can remove a lot of the important information and nuance about what is happening to someone by putting a label on them that doesn't match up with uh, who they see themselves as um, or how they interact with the world. So I, I really appreciate you raising that question. Thank you, Amin, so much for your question. Uh, I'll be asking our final question. It's again from Emmy, but she's no longer with us. So I'll just um, ask the question here, which is about entrepreneurship. So why is there so little government support for young women in entrepreneurship? Why are women, especially BIPOC women, left out of grants, mentorship, and subsidies? Um, so I think it's a really important question um, about how we ensure that government uh, outreach and support around economic development and uh, and mentorship and um, opportunities are uh, the programs we put in place include uh, opportunities for everyone and um, and and including groups that are traditionally excluded or marginalized like young women or young BIPOC women. Um, you know, some of government's work already has focused on ensuring those opportunities are more available. I talked about the community benefits agreements around building infrastructure, around participating in the trades and, uh, and, and having opportunities and work that traditionally um, uh, that particular group, young uh, BIPOC women have been almost entirely excluded from uh, really unfairly um, and, and working to ensure that public money invested in building things helps give those opportunities. Um, but the, the point of the uh, race-based data collection and the putting the lens on our programs uh, around um, uh, are we ensuring that uh, the GBA plus analysis that we do, the you know, oppression, oppression analysis that we do around new programs, legislation gives people the chance to participate. And, and uh, we've got a lot more work to do as the question uh, rightly indicates. But uh, Rashna, do you um, have any thoughts particularly around this issue? I know uh, Ravi uh, Kailan, our Minister for Economic Development, is very interested in this issue. Yeah, no, I, you have summed it uh, well, uh, David. Uh, we know uh, uh, because of the lack of the data, we don't have the right information a lot of times. And I know that sometimes that women are left behind and especially women of color, uh, the racialized women. Uh, I know, uh, as Minister has mentioned, uh, Minister Kalong is working with his uh, economic recovery plan to support the businesses that are already owned by the IPCOC community. And, uh, uh, but like how to motivate more women to enter, how to break those barriers, that is something uh, that I would really like to work with uh, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, the Parliamentary Secretary for Gender Equity, uh, and also uh, with Minister of Advanced Education, how to create those courses, how to create uh, the programs that uh, encourages women, as we are uh, encouraging women to get into the STEM programs, we want to, uh, uh, we would really like to encourage young women to get into the business, uh, take up the business opportunities as well. So this is something that uh, we, uh, we uh, as a government are very keen to look into. Thank you so much, Rashna and David, for those great responses and everyone who contributed to our question and answer part of our debate or our forum, sorry. Um, we will, or we apologize if we didn't have time to ask or answer your question, but we, I would now like to introduce Emily, who is going to close out our event with some important information. And then we'll have a few last words from Parliamentary Secretary Singh. 
Thanks, Bella. Hi, guys. My name is Emily, and I'm an 11th grader at Kitsilano Secondary School who's been involved with the Youth Council for the past three years. First off, thank you so much to everyone for participating. We really appreciate all of your amazing questions and ideas. A big thank you to Rachna and David for all the information they have provided, as well as for their time and effort. Thank you to our tech crew, Eduardo and James from Event Lab. They have helped us so much behind the scenes and an especially big thank you to our wonderful Youth Council for sacrificing their time and energy to make this event possible. And to everyone who joined us, we understand how busy everyone is with work and school these days. So we really appreciate you all taking the time to come discuss some very important topics with us today. As Eileen mentioned earlier, we really want to make sure we're improving these events in the future, as we're hoping to organize one on climate change, homelessness, and anti-poverty policy soon. So it would be really helpful if we get your feedback. We are providing a link in the Zoom chat to a Google form where you can give us some feedback. We really appreciate you taking the time to fill it out and letting us know how we can make our next events better. If you're interested in upcoming events or you want to get involved with the work we do, feel free to leave your name and email in the Google form as well. You can also indicate if you would only like to receive email updates or if you would like to be more actively involved in council meetings and activities. If you have any questions about complaint channels or other concrete issues you are facing, email david.eb.mla at leg.bc.ca and David's staff will get you to the right place. And now I'll be passing the baton back to David and Roshna. Thank you so much, Emily, and thank you to the Youth Council for organizing. And thanks to everybody who was on the uh, call tonight and for all your great questions, some of which um, uh, raised really important issues and stumped us. Uh, so uh, you put some thought into this and you really uh, 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 made us uh, uh, think about policy that uh, policy areas where we might need to uh, put additional focus, which was the whole point of the event. And, and actually the whole point of the Youth Council uh, is to raise issues um, for me, for my colleagues, uh, around uh, youth uh, concerns and interests that we might be missing. Uh, so if we weren't able to answer your question on the spot, I want you to know uh, that uh, your question and, and your interest in particular policy areas, uh, that, that that actually was part of the process and we're very appreciative that you raised those issues. Um, now, Rachna is launching uh, her uh, public engagements on race-based data and the Anti-Racism -Anti Act. And, uh, and we also have ongoing the Police Act review uh, you can participate in both of those. I'm going to uh, pass it over to Rachna, uh, and uh, but but please uh, don't miss the opportunity to participate. We had so many thoughtful comments, uh, and your your voice is needed in those engagements. So please uh, uh, provide your feedback in those uh, processes, Rachna. Oh, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to be joining you today, and all the questions that you asked. And uh, it always encourages me whenever. Uh, I'm having such conversations, especially with the, with the youth, uh, that uh, uh, it makes me feel that our future is in the right hands. Uh, the important issues that you brought up today, and especially the uh, equity and justice lens that you are uh, looking at, and looking at different issues, not just education, not just policing, not just healthcare, but everything but from that lens that is extremely important. And as David has mentioned that the public consultations are uh, already ongoing, especially with our police act review committee. Uh, that is one of the most important committees that the, that the legislature has at this time. A lot of important changes are going to come in the police act, especially with the, uh, with the lens of systemic racism or with the mental health issues. Uh, would really like to hear from you. Uh, and uh, it's very easy to participate. Uh, if you don't want to, participate in person, you can do a written submission and please do that. And if you need more information, please reach out. Uh, you can reach out to MLA EB's uh, uh, office or my office. And uh, we would love to give you more information about that. And this is not just the end of the conversation. I think this is the beginning of the conversations that we have started. These are very important topics. And uh, if you have any other further questions, I would love to answer them. Thank you so much. Hey, can we flip to gallery view to see Everybody who is on the call, we still have most of the people who are. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> See you later. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much, uh, folks. Youth Council. Bye bye. You're awesome. Bye bye. Thank you.